I'll be reading from Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised before him through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who, as to his early life, was a descendant of David. Oh, chapter 5. Well, there we go. My apologies. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. This is the word of the Lord. Country, but read the scripture? I don't know. That's okay. Thanks, Mark. Um, the word peace and 2020 don't seem to go together, do they? It's, uh, it's actually a little hard even to think about um, peace right now. It, uh, in fact, it almost feels unkind to talk about peace right now. Um, When we we think, oh, peace, peace on earth, goodwill to me. Anybody want to roll their eyes? Anybody want to just get a little cynical and, oh, yeah, oh, peace on earth. Oh, that's the fairy tale of the Bible. Oh, yeah, that's right. Anybody want to take Linus's blanket and say, I bring you good news of great joy. This will be for all the people. Actually, he drops the blanket um, when he says that. But as I've experienced 2020, and I remember how my lungs burned during the fires, and I was pretty angry, um, as I would read the news and see those, remember those maps when COVID first started, when you see these circles just exploding of people getting infected, and then You'd see death rates rising. I, peace? Not so sure. But honestly, the hardest was here in December, right? With Artsakh? When, when you heard about the peace treaty, how many of you wanted to throw the, whatever device you were reading on or put your hand through a TV if you were, or your computer screen? Peace? That's peace? Sorry, I would not use peace to describe what happened um, in the close of the the war in Artsakh. I mean, peace, it really feels like a fairy tale at times. But I want to tell you that as we finish 2020, as we celebrate the real birth of the real Son of God, experiencing the peace of God transforms our lives. I'm going to say that again. Experiencing the peace of God can transform our lives. It is the peace of God truly can be the most real experience that any of us can have on planet Earth. So many people have been looking in so many different ways Oh, if we just have a vaccine. Oh, if we just stop fighting in our side. Oh, if we just get the fires under control. Oh, oh, oh. We are not going to find a peace that can transform our lives apart from the living God. It is impossible. See, what, what Mark read, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God Through our Lord Jesus Christ. So many of us are trying to make, you know, somehow reconcile our relationships apart from Christ. The only way we are going to have peace horizontally or relationally here on earth is if we first have peace with God. And I'm only using these dimensions. He's not up there. He's right here. But 
with God, we have peace. And when we have peace with God, we can then have peace with those who have hurt us, those who have offended us. I'm not candy coating, I'm not whitewashing the reality of conflict. But it's possible to experience, have your life transformed by the peace of God. And, but Paul makes it clear, it comes through our faith. We're justified, we're declared righteous. God lets us have a relationship with him when we trust in Jesus Christ. See, the first several chapters of Romans, I should have actually let Mark read all of chapters 1 through 3, just to give us the context. Because when you read Paul's letter to the Romans, you realize that there is a war going on. And it's us, human beings, giving God the finger, not this one, not this finger, not this finger, and not this finger. We're giving God the finger. We're saying, we don't want you to rule our lives. Leave us alone. Give me everything I need. But then just leave us alone. We're going to live our own lives. See, that's the reality of the world that we're in. But rather than condemn us, and I said this in Armenian, rather than condemn us, rather than judge us, God at infinite cost to himself offers his son. And not coming down in some sort of Superman costume, not coming down in lightning and clouds and demanding submission from his rebellious creation. How does he come? He comes as a baby, the most vulnerable of all human beings. He comes and he says, if you trust in me, not in a baby, but in the baby who grows up and does what? Who identifies with what it means to be a human being, who experiences every temptation just like we face, and then offers himself to pay the punishment that my sin deserves. My sin put Jesus on the cross. Your sin put Jesus on the cross. He didn't have to do it. He could have just condemned us all. But rather than do that, he says, I'll take your place. And not only will I die for you, I will conquer death and I will rise from the dead. Now, do you believe that? If you believe that, that's what he means when he says we've been justified by faith. If you believe that what God has done in sending Jesus is enough to forgive your sin, if you believe that, that's what it means to be justified by faith. Not by something you do. And every one of us at one time or another, maybe even right now, we've tried to impress God, right? We've tried to impress him. We've tried, if I only do this, if, if I do this, and that person really bugs me, um, but I'll be nice to them. And maybe God will pat me on the back, maybe give me a few brownie points. Maybe, maybe I'll get to wear some ribbons on my lapel, but he says, please don't do that. I've already done what you could never do. I've offered myself. And, and so the war with God is over. See, when we, it says we have peace with God, you've heard the word shalom, salem, haochun. It's, it's peace. It's not just the absence of war and conflict. But it's an abundance, it's an abundance of, of peace. Yesterday I was talking with Mark's friend, and we were talking about skydiving. And yes, I'd done that, and I know you think I'm crazy. Um, but when we took the college group years ago, we did the, uh, the tandem jump. We jumped out of the plane. The sh we, we fell fast. That's a whole nother story. I love that. 
sort of like adrenaline. But then the person that was on my back pulled the chute. And we shot up. And in a moment, I experienced a peace, a silence. And I just looked out. I saw the mountain. They were, mountains were at eye level because we were 5,000 feet. I'm looking, and I'm not hearing anything. Peace. Peace. And again, it wasn't just the absence of noise. It was the sense of safety. I know it sounds crazy, but the guy on my back, he was taking care of everything. I was just going for the ride. Absolute security and peace. That's what he offers us. We don't have to, as I just said, we don't have to be afraid of God. God offers us peace when we trust him. When I was in Armenia years ago, um, I, had, I had studied Russian in what is now St. Petersburg and flew to Armenia by myself. Probably not the smartest move when you don't speak Armenian, but I did it anyway. And my, my driver came to meet me at uh, the Hotel Ani. And he picked me up and he, I was wearing sunglasses. And he looked at my sunglasses and tells me in Russian, oh, those are very nice sunglasses. Those are very nice sunglasses. I said, yes, they are. Thank you. And one of the things we learned when we went to Armenia back at that time is if, if you said you liked something, that obligated the person <laughs> to whom you spoke to give it to you. So I knew what he was doing. And, but we were having a great time. And so about, oh, maybe 10 minutes into the ride, I took my sunglasses off and I gave them to Krikor. And he put them on. And if you speak Russian, you'll know. It's like, ochen spokoine. Ochen spokoine. They're peaceful. They're calming. These, and, and we had the best drive the rest of the way. He actually saved me from being mugged later in the afternoon. So that was really a great time. Lot, very good. But it's peace. The peace we have with God isn't just that I'm not looking over my shoulder or waiting for the shoe to drop. I'm expecting abundance. I have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have peace with God? Because if not, the Advent candles, the little nativity scenes, they're absolutely empty. They're absolutely empty. But if you do trust in Jesus, you have peace, peace with God. And he, he goes further. He says, we have access to God's grace. Again, I think when he says we have peace with God and we have access to grace, he's giving this word shalom. He's filling it out. It's not just the absence of conflict. It's the expectation of abundance from God. We have access. We have access to God's grace. It's not about fear. But I, I want to ask you, do you expect good from God? Or again, do you think if you maybe read your Bible enough, or if you pray long enough, or if you come to church, whoa, come to church, or maybe watch on live stream, is that what gives you, what does grace mean? Grace means it's undeserved, unmerited, uh, just pouring out of God's love and abundance on us. Is that what you expect from him? So I love having children in service. I hope you did. don't move, don't go away. I want to hear them cry. I want to hear them make noise. Because those children expect absolutely everything from you. There is nothing that those children will not ask of mom and dad. And Babugan. <laughs> and grandma and everybody else in the family. They have absolute expectation that they get grace. Do they deserve it? Is it because they smiled? Is it because they slept? No. They ex it's grace. It's grace. Is that how you approach God? Or are you a little afraid of him? Ooh, I haven't been so faithful this week. 
Ooh, I've been angry. Did I forget to pray? Of course you did. Of course you did. We are sinners who are saved by grace. I've said this before, and to me it's the picture of having access to the grace of God. He says, we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. I picture the Pacific Ocean. I picture the ocean, and I picture walking out into the ocean, having the water absolutely surround me, and I feel the waves pushing me all over the place, but I'm standing. And unlike the ocean, I'm absolutely safe because the grace in which we stand is actually protecting me. It's actually watching out for me, not just me, for us. This grace in which we stand is God's gift of abundance. Do you expect that from him? Or is it only for those who haven't been naughty? Did you make the nice list? Is that really how your relationship with God works? Because that's not Christianity, and I want to make that really clear. If you think God's grace comes to you only when you're good, that's not Christianity. It's a gift. It's a gift of grace. And so he says, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. We boast or we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You know when you rejoice and you boast at the same time? It's like, yes. Yes, Stanford won yesterday. They did. One point. Double overtime. I'm boasting. Yes, I rejoice. Army won yesterday. That's right. Army and Stanford. Not bad. Not bad in our family yesterday. That doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter, but what do we do? We boast. We rejoice. We're loud about it. Have you been loud about your love for Jesus lately? Have you been loud? Have you boasted in the hope of the glory of God lately? Or do you sit shyly? Oh, someone, they may not talk to me anymore. They may not be my friend anymore. They may not... Oh, I don't know. I'll just wait till the right time to talk to them about Jesus. If you have trusted in Jesus Christ, you have hope for the glory of God. Not to crush you, not to destroy you, but to exalt you. Wait, really? See, you know how this whole story ends. When Jesus comes back, The second time, what happens to us? We are transformed in a moment. I just participated in Margaret Harrison's burial on Monday. Faithful woman, 100 years old, almost 101. Her frail body was in the casket, but her spirit was with the Lord. But there's going to be a day when Jesus returns, this is the hope of the glory of God, that that frail, beaten down body is going to be transformed and be just like that of Jesus at his resurrection. Okay, you're saying amen. I want you to boast. I want you to rejoice in front of others so that they would know that you have a hope. We're not brought to despair because of COVID. Even, again, Alice Dachessian, her husband went to be with the Lord. That woman absolutely floored me because she was rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God even though her husband had died. Of course she was grieving. She does not want to spend a day without him here on earth. But he's gone to be with the Lord. But she is rejoicing. This is not just storybook. This is not even just truth written in scripture. This is in real life. Are you boasting? Are you boasting of the glory, the hope of the glory of God? Well, what about 2020? (laughs) What about our suffering? How can this be? Does it really work? What about suffering in hard times? 
Does it still work? Does the gospel really work in real life? Is it working for you? We can be honest if it's not. If it's not, you've forgotten what you're doing here. If you've forgotten, you bought a version of faith in Jesus Christ, following Jesus Christ, that is not the truth. He does not promise everything is going to be beautiful and wonderful and roses. You realize that for at least three centuries after Christ rose from the dead, if you followed Christ, suffering was guaranteed. Persecution was guaranteed. If he happened to be Armenian, death was guaranteed. We rejoice that we were the first Christian nation in 301. Do you know there's a little time between 33 AD and 301? Uh, several hundred years. How did the gospel spread throughout the known world that fast? You ever thought about that? How did it do that? Well, let's just look at what the Bible says. Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering because we know that suffering produces endurance. Sorry, suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. See, we can glory in our suffering because we have experienced peace with God. See, we can, we're not just stoically enduring, gritting our teeth or whining, whatever your pleasure is. See, peace is the abundance experiencing God's grace that can overpower, it can overpower our suffering because it gives us purpose. You know how this is going to end. You know that it ends with the hope of the glory of God. But what do you do between now and then as you suffer? Well, he says that there's purpose. It's not random. It is not nonsense. Now, we think our suffering is nonsense, don't we? We think if God would just, let's go, Lord, come on, this, we, we've had enough. We've had enough. That's like me when I'm running. If I'm doing the marathon, Right around mile 20, that thing called the wall, I would really like it if I could just redefine a marathon and say, okay, it stops now. Wouldn't you love to do that when in the midst of the, the trials and the difficulties that you're facing to say, okay, enough. That's enough. You know, I listened to my son talk about his experience in the Army, and there's been more than enough times when he has been ready to say, Gapave, enough. I think I've learned everything I need to learn in this one right now. And he's got that officer just pushing and pushing and pushing. And it's not fun. We joke and I tease him and ask him how summer camp is going. Um, but it's hard. It is hard. Your suffering is hard. And I love that Paul doesn't try to speak pie in the sky. It's not random. It's real. It may seem like nonsense to us, but it's not nonsense to God. See, it's trusting him that when we go through suffering, he has a purpose, that it's going to create perseverance. No one signs up for perseverance. And God, in his wisdom, uses suffering so that we learn to stand up under pressure. See, perseverance brings character. Character. Character is who you are when the pressure is on. Character is who you are when the pressure is on. Most of us can do really well when things are really nice. What happens when you're disappointed? What happens when someone genuinely has done something to hurt you? Maybe they didn't even mean to, but how do you react to that? God is using it. Excuse me. God can use it to mold your character. Now I need to ask you, how many of you, no, not how many of you, you, one by one, 
Are we cooperating? Are we continuing to trust when we face difficulties? Are we going to continue to trust him or only trust him when we can see that it's good? Okay, the scripture that that Mariam read. My eyes have seen your salvation. You know what he was looking at when he told God he saw his salvation? He was looking at a person. He was looking at a seven or eight day old baby. That's faith. See, will you and I trust him to mold our character? Will we cooperate and trust him and say that we have hope? We have hope. See, experiencing God's peace, I I entitled the message, Peace, the Gift that Keeps on Giving, because having peace with God, having a relationship with God, genuinely can transform our lives. And it's not just at the end. It's right here, right now. I can have hope that this is not for nothing, that what you're suffering is for a purpose, that hope is genuine. It's not a fairy tale. See, God's love guarantees no shame and no disappointment. Did you catch that in verse 5? Hope does not put us to shame. Hope does not put us to shame. Another way of translating that is hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. See, have you, I, I'm going to ask you this, have you experienced God's love? A number of, of us could say, no, I, I've prayed to receive Jesus. But if it's only here, if it's only in your head, if it's never sort of worked its way through to the essence of your being, have you experienced the love of God? Have you experienced the love of God? He says our hope does not disappoint. Our hope doesn't put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And a number of you remember how John L. illustrated this idea. Um, I think it was last year, and it just made such an impact on me. She motioned. I don't even remember if she had a, a picture in her hand or not, but it was so vivid. Picture, picture a pitcher of water being poured into a cup. And just when you're about to say, enough, it starts overflowing. And you're looking, it's like, okay, that's enough. That's enough. You can stop now. And God just sort of leans in and keeps pouring. He just keeps pouring. And he just keeps pouring. And he just keeps pouring. Some of us today... Even if we profess faith in Christ, even if we profess that we have peace with God, if we're honest, we're like, I don't know if I've ever felt. We're human beings. We're not just human minds. God gives us his spirit and pours out his love. So I'm going to ask you, have you ever felt the experience of the presence of the Holy Spirit. If you haven't, Merry Christmas. This is your time. Ask him. Remember the ocean that we stand in? It's the ocean of his grace. Can you imagine standing in the midst of his grace and then with a huge smile on his face, there's a downpour over you. And so it just keeps coming. It's pouring down his love all over you. That's not just supposed to be for a few of the really emotional Christians. This is what he offers to us. The reason we know that our hope is not going to be disappointed, the reason we know we will never feel shame in the presence of God it's because he's poured out his love over us through his spirit. Please don't let those words pass right past you. Please, just would you ask him, Lord, I don't know what he's talking about. 
but could I experience that too? I do believe in you. I do believe what you did on the cross. If you want the objective measure that does God love me, okay, right there. Every time you pass a church, every time you see a necklace or earrings or, or see a cross, that is the objective proof that God loves you. He could not love you more. He gave his only son. Can't do more than that. But if something is missing subjectively, personally, would you just ask him? He pours out his love through the Holy Spirit whom he's given us. Romans 8 ends like this, and I'd like to end our sermon today. And if we could have the team come forward as I read Romans chapter 8. And I strongly urge you, if you are given to read Scripture, which I sure hope you are, if you're given to memorize Scripture, which I sure hope you are, this would be a passage to, to spend some time with. Verse 38 of Romans chapter 8. For I am convinced. I am convinced. Say that with me. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Experiencing the peace of God can absolutely transform our life. The gift that keeps on giving your relationship with the living God, your grace is all around you. You have hope of the glory of God. You can endure suffering because you know, you know it's going to produce perseverance. You know it's going to 